Okay. So, introduction to stored procedures. Uh, you know, this is not new concepts, really. I mean, you, we talked the other day about batches and how they work, right? And that's great. You can sit down and write a bunch of commands, send it off, create an execution plan, and have it run. But, you know, not too many people in the real world sit there manually writing up each command that they want to run. Typically, things happen over and over again, okay? So you want to encapsulate them. So you can just call it by name for a given job or process or whatever, and away you go. Same as pretty much all programming languages again. So a stored procedure, we're going to be eventually looking at a couple variations on this, functions and triggers and things, but basically it's all the same general idea. There's just little differences here and there. The idea, it's a collection of statements stored on the server, right? So it becomes an object. That's the difference here, right? Kind of like we created tables and views and they live on the server. You don't have to recreate them every time. Once you make a stored procedure, it stays there on the server and we can call it whenever we want it to. So obviously, you know, the uh, idea is we can work with variables, all of our fancy programming, super fancy <laughs> programming that we can do in this procedural language and away we go. Okay, so it'll perform operations obviously in the database, that's where it lives, so it's really there to work with data and tables for the most part and so on. You can call other stored procedures from within stored procedures. Uh, they have parameters, right, so you can pass values in as parameters just like you can with methods and functions and so on that you've done before. It returns a pretty simple thing, just a, usually used for a status value, it's an integer, right, that's all you get. So kind of a little confusing at first when I say it returns because what it is is if you s use like an assignment statement say you've made a variable hopefully of integer type so it's compatible you could say like set your variable equals and then have the command to execute the stored procedure inside the stored procedure you can simply say return and it returns that integer value but that's all you can't return dates you can't return anything you know more interesting than a simple integer so it's kind of limited and it's mainly used, as I say here, as a status value, usually so you could then a Boolean expression check if your procedure even ran, right, or if it returned a success code type of thing, okay? If you knew, do need to get another value other than that simple integer value out of a stored procedure, then we can also create output parameters. So we can pass values in through parameters and we can also retrieve data out of parameters. That being said, if you actually have a select statement inside your procedure, well, it's going to run, and if it's a data returning select procedure, it will return that result set. But it's more like a byproduct, really, of running the stored procedure than it is something that it returns directly. Okay? Just want to highlight the difference there. Well, how do these work? Well, we talked about batches and how they get compiled in an execution plan, so not surprisingly, this is going to be something similar, right? The first time you call a stored procedure, it will first of all parse it, check for those uh, syntax errors and so on. And then it goes into this uh, optimization process, right? Where it'll optimize and pile it and come up with an execution plan, which gets stored, by the way, in a procedure cache, and then it will execute it, okay? So the first time it goes through all those steps. By the way, this whole optimization business, I, you know, it might be a little fuzzy in your head what that's all about. I mean. You call something to do a, a job, you think it's just going to go ahead and do it. But the thing is, in a database where you're working with large amounts of data, there are choices to be made sometimes. Do we sort first or filter first? Do we sort on this field or that field, which will give us quicker response back and things like that? How does the system know what's the most optimal way to carry out any group of commands? Well, actually, there's a lot going on under the hood that, fortunately, <laughs> we don't usually have to worry about. But it's good to be aware of what some of the things are. So I'll maybe just give you a bit of a peek under the hood and mention one of the things that it does, it monitors all the time, is it keeps track of statistics on things like how much variation there is in a column. So think, example, even of a last name column, right? Something we cut off an index so that we can quickly process things alphabetically by last name or whatever. Well, depending on the amount of data and where the data is coming from, there could be quite a difference between how similar values are, right? 
could be that every last name in your system is totally unique. No two people have the same last name. Eh, not probably very real world, right? Uh, and depending on the region of the world, you might find a lot of people with the same last name. Go to England, there's probably a whole bunch of Browns and Smiths and so on, right? In other countries, it might be uh, you or something else, right? So, you know, that's all tracked in the statistics of the tables themselves. And so the optimizer will look and see, okay, well, you know, if 40% of all the last names in this million row table are exactly the same, you know, then sorting it by that isn't going to do me much good. So I'll come up with a more optimized way to approach getting the answers you're after. I just want to give you a bit of a peek as to what kind of things happen in the optimization itself. Okay, subsequent processing. Now that's the first time. It's got to go through all those steps, but remember we said the execution plan could be cached. So the second time you ask for the same thing to run, uh, it will just pull that out of the cache if it's still there, and it's much, much faster. Right? So that's one of the advantages, and historically, this approach was one of the main reasons why stored procedures became so very, very important and widely used in all database applications. Not quite as critical now because usually most systems will even cache the execution plan for ad hoc queries, ones that you just kind of make up on the fly. Right? It used to be it was only stored procedures that would cache. Now it caches just about everything. But still, stored procedures have their power and their uses as well. Couldn't do without them. So lots of advantages, reasons why they're important. Right? The basic one is just that they do encapsulate business functionality. There's a repeated task, even something as simple as inserting a new customer, right? or placing an order and things like that. So you might do all the steps involved in that in a stored procedure. Because your business process is going to call that to happen over and over and over again. Right? Also, it can hide table details. In fact, many systems are set up in the world that you write all these stored procedures to do the actual work in the system, and that's all you expose. So your interface to interact with the database is entirely through the stored procedures. So in a client application, it doesn't even have any idea of what tables, what the schema is, what many-to-many -many or one-to-many. It doesn't care. All it knows is that it has these stored procedures to call, and by doing so, you get all the work done you need to do, right? So it kind of, you know, is a security mechanism in that sense because it hides or abstracts away all the actual plumbing going on internally inside the database, right? Improved performance, well, we talked about that, caching and so on, and network traffic. Obviously, the more work we can do on the server, <laughs> the better, right? You know, if you're talking large amounts of data, well, if you've got sorting and filtering and work like that to do, you don't want to bring all the data through the network down to your local computer to their sort and filter, right? You want to do all that so a very small result set is probably what you'll get back. And it's probably faster to do it on the server because it's a more powerful machine anyway. So lots of reasons for that. Create, alter, and drop. We're going to see those over and over again. You learn them with tables and views. Pretty quick on views, but you did see it, right? Well, same kind of thing. These are objects that are going to live in the system. So to create them, Big surprise! Create, right? Create procedure. Optionally, you can give it a schema name, which if you don't, by default, you get what? Anyone know? Three letters. We're always showing up sometimes when you... Uh, yeah. DBO, database owner. <laughs> That's the default schema unless you... By the way, people might say, well, what is a schema anyway? The idea is if you have a large number of objects in a system, and they're kind of segregated in you know, what they're used for. Maybe some are all related to the online store and some are related to the personnel department, things like that. And you might make a schema just to make it easy to separate them into sort of logical groups and identify them by the schema name. It's really not a big deal, okay? But the procedure name has to be unique inside the database, by the way. Uh, you can have procedures with the same name in separate databases, but not in the same database. Optionally, a parameter list. Not all stored procedures need a parameter, right? But many, many do. So you'll have a comma separated list of parameters. And then our good old friend, our keyword as, right? And then we have the body of the procedure uh, defined itself. Okay? Simple, simple example of a basic, basic <laughs> stored procedure. And you remember me mentioning the other day about that? Northwind database, that was the for years used as Microsoft's example database, and it was absolute crap. 
Okay, it was an internal joke at Microsoft about how bad it was. Okay, well, you'll get a chance to see some of the reasons why. It's because I decided to use it to show you what not to do. Okay, <laughs> so we're using Northwind here, creating procedure overdue orders. Right, and this shows you that a procedure can be as simple as wrapping up a select statement that you might commonly want to run. So rather than having to remember the select statement, in this case, we can just call it as a sort of procedure. Right? There are no parameters in this one, because we really don't have to tell it anything. It's still dynamic, because it does use get date. Right? So all it's really doing is it's selecting all the orders where the required date is passed, okay? it's before get date, and the ship date is null. So guess what? It's overdue. Right? So on any given day, I can run this and find out what are the orders that are overdue, which when should have shipped by now, they were required, but they haven't shipped yet. Okay, simple example of a stored procedure. No parameters. A result set is returned as a byproduct of executing it. Right? So we do get data, a data set back. Okay. How do we execute a procedure? Well, execute. That's the command word, right? You know, You'll notice that a lot of these command words, you can actually shorten it to the first four letters. Same with pro procedure. You can say create proc, P-R-O-C, right, as a short form instead of saying the whole word procedure. I know, it's just so much work typing all those extra letters, right? Well, shorten it if you want to. Same with execute. You can just say E-X-E-C instead. And then you call the procedure. After the name of the procedure, you pass the values for the parameters, right? We'll talk about two different styles of passing values to the parameters. I know it's basic stuff, but we need to cover it at least once. Oh, I should maybe mention here, you can call it to execute. You don't have to worry about a return value. You don't, it's not a requirement to be looking for that, okay? Uh, it'll just execute anyway. But if it does return something, remember we talked about it can only return an integer. We could set it up in an assignment statement, set our variable to hold the integer equals execute if you wanted to check and see what it is. Okay, so with our example one, our super duper overdue order store procedure, all I have to do is say execute and store procedure name. Simple as that, there's no parameters, so away you go. Altering and dropping, okay, these are very much like views. Table's the only thing that's a little different. Remember we saw you could create table and then run multiple alter table commands afterwards just to tweak it a little bit, add a little thing here, a little new column there maybe, things like that. Well, that's the exception. The general rule with most database objects is when you say alter, basically you're saying replace the old version with this new complete version, right? So we don't say alter and say change line 47 to this, no. Okay, we have to give a complete full definition of the object, in this case a stored procedure important you realize that distinction. Table is the only exception. Everything else, we're just replacing it with a new version, right? This means you don't have to drop it and recreate it again. Okay. Delete, there you go, drop. Drop procedure and its name. That's all it takes. So you can create, alter, and drop. Pretty straightforward, very standard. We're going to see that over and over again with all these different new types of objects we're learning about. Okay, now in terms of the parameters, we have two types of parameters. I briefly mentioned that already, input and output parameters, right? Obviously, input parameters are used usually somewhere internally in the logic or filter or calculations or something of the procedure itself. Output parameters we'll get to in a minute, but basically that allows us to pass values other than a simple integer, uh, a specific value back to the calling code. So, a lot of information we passed in. We Declare them almost like they're variables, but you don't have to say declare because it's a parameter, right? But they look like a doc. I mean, they look like a variable. They walk like a variable, right? They have a data type like a variable. So in every way, you might think of them just as variables that are specially used to pass values in. Okay? So the syntax, we don't have to say declare, but it will still be our wonderful at symbol, and then the name or identifier for the parameter, a data type. Optionally, though, in this case, because we're calling this to execute, okay, we can define a uh, possible default value. One thing it does is it makes the parameter optional. You don't have to supply a value for it if it has a default. Right? Default is often just the word null as well, or it could be something else, but 
you know, it's got to be something. So it makes it optional parameter if it has a default, okay? If it has a default, you can still pass a value to it. It'll take whatever value you give it. It's just if you don't, don't give it a value yourself when you call the procedure to execute, then it will use the default instead. Just a note there, the default must be either a constant or the word null. You can't have an expression there. Something has to be calculated first, okay? Defaults have to be static in that sense. Okay, so here's another example of a stored procedure committing one of the worst sins in the world of database design. If you write code like this, I will come and wake you up in the middle of the night, slap you the side of the head and say, you don't deserve to sleep, okay? You should lose all sleep forever, right? If you do things like put spaces in the names of things. I mean, that's just wrong. That's just terrible sin, right? But it's an example of the kind of thing they do in this Northwind database. So, create procedure, year-to-year -year sales, okay? If you really want to call it something like that, then put underscores or something. Yeah, it's, just, it's just not right. Okay, then we, in this example, we have a couple of parameters, okay? At beginning date, type date time. At ending date, type date time, right? Then we say as, then we have the body. So this is showing what's often considered a good practice. It's not always necessary depending on how you're using the parameters, but what we'll do is, in this case, we're going to check and see, do we have valid values to use, right? Why wait for an error to happen? Let's check first, okay? So instead of, like our try catch, instead of trying it and then catching the error, we're going to check first. So if either is null, basically, then what we're going to do is we're going to raise an error. Yes. You have the power to raise errors, okay? As the programmer, you don't have to just get the errors all the time, like I do. <laughs> you can actually raise them yourself, okay? Raise error, you can pass a, an, a message for your error. Uh, by the way, this is a severity level, okay? Remember we talked about there's three different ranges of severity levels. In the highest range, it just stops everything. Uh, in the lowest range, it just skips over that, says, okay, I couldn't do that one, but I'll do the next commands and so on. All right, so if either date is null, we'll raise an error, and return means that's it, we're done, we're jumping out of here, right? If we actually have values for a beginning and ending date, okay, then we just have, once again, a simple select statement, right? This one is written using a one-letter table aliases. This is a very common practice for programmers who hate to type, okay? Now, you're familiar with table aliases, I know, because everyone in the room had the fun of learning recursive uh, relationships, and you can't query those without table aliases, so I know it's not a new concept for you, right? So we're selecting from orders, O, by the way, with table aliases, you don't actually have to say the word as. You can just leave a space and give the alias name. You can say as, right? You can say as, yeah, it's perfectly allowed. And look at this, order subtotals, that's a table. And they did that sin, they should rot forever, right? They put a space in the name of the table. It's just wrong, wrong. Okay. But you see the idea here. We have a where clause for this select query using our parameters, okay, between the beginning date and ending date, right? So you might say, well, all this really is a select query, but in a sense, we've kind of parameterized, parameterized this query because we're able to pass in dynamically in code different date ranges that we want to uh, check on, right? Okay. Questions about that? All uh, right. This is, like, this is, I know you said it earlier, but the at symbol, we're using that to declare parameters. Yeah, and they're just like a variable. So just because we're using to declare variables. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so just a bit more about parameters then. Uh, just to give you a lot to look at on the screen, this store procedure here, notice I ended at the keyword as. I'm not gonna worry about how it's done right now. We're focusing just on the parameters. This procedure is to add a new customer, <coughs> right? What kind of a SQL command would we use probably in the body of this procedure, do you think? If I'm gonna add a customer, put a customer record in the table, yeah? No, that would be to update a customer. You're going to add a new one. Uh, 
So what's our action query? Yeah? Insert. Insert. Right. Okay. So eventually that's what we're going to be doing now. We're going to be inserting a record into our customer table. Right? Now, you know what an insert looks like. You've do worked with those quite a few times now. So basically we insert values for potentially all the fields in the table. So that's what you see listed here. These are parameters pretty much one for one corresponding to all the fields in the table. Typical practice for this kind of a stored procedure is look at the table. And even the create table statement if you have access to it or just generate it. And basically what we usually do in a situation like this is we take every field, just make a parameter with the same name, just stick the at symbol in front. Right? So we have a parameter with at in front for every field. And the data types of our parameters, of course, will be exact same usually as the data types of the actual fields in the table, right? So it gives us the ability to have values here in our stored procedure to populate all the fields in this new record we're going to create in our customer table. I think that makes pretty clear sense. But you'll notice something kind of funny going on here, all these equal nulls, right? We talked about that we can give a default value to parameters, so if we don't have anything to pass, it will use the default. What does this tell me about the structure of the table, the customer table in this case itself? Which fields are absolutely required and which ones aren't? The ones that aren't required? Yeah, exactly. So really there's only two. Customer ID, which I probably can guess is probably the primary key, <laughs> okay, is uh, NCHAR, so we do supply the value for it. Right? It doesn't allow null because the primary key would never allow null. Company name obviously is set up in the table design that it doesn't allow nulls either. Can't create a company without the company name. All the other fields in the table, I can tell from this or infer, I guess you could say from this, that they probably allow null values, which is why we've set up the parameters with defaults of null. Then when we call this to ex execute, we only have to pass values to the ones that we want to, right? Min at the minimum, just these two. And any other of this information we have, we can provide as well. So with that in mind, just kind of remember this, we're gonna look at a couple of different ways that we can actually provide the values in a situation like this, when we have all these parameters to worry about, but most of them allow nulls. So, Ah, there we go. So named input parameters. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Here's the one style or one way of passing values for the parameters. When you call execute on your stored procedure, you can just immediately start. Now this is just put vertically so it fits on the screen, but it could be all along on one line too, whichever way you like to do it, right? But I just have a comma separated list of it looks like assignments here, right? Parameter name equals value. Parameter name equals value. By naming each one, okay, then I'm saying these are the ones I have a value for. If you no look carefully, if you look at the last slide in this one, you see the list is shorter. There's two missing. If you compare them side to side, you'll find the two missing are region and the fax number. We don't have values for those. But you know what? With this way of passing parameters with name parameters, I don't even have to mention them or worry about them because I'm naming each one and of course the order that I actually do this doesn't matter because I'm naming each one so I can do this in any order I want, just leave out anything that I don't care about as long as it's optional to begin with, right? Just going back a second, one more time, so notice region is here and the fax is at the end. That kind of comes up as important in the next thing we're going to talk about, so the fax number is the last one defined in the create procedure statement. So named input parameters, I think people are pretty familiar with this approach, right? We can also just pass the parameters by position. It's less typing, right? You don't actually have to type all the parameter names, okay? All we do is the parameter values must be listed, okay, with comma, separ comma separating them, but they have to be in the exact order that they were defined in the create procedure statement the exact same order. And of course that also implies that if you have one you're not supplying something for in the middle, well, you're gonna have to put a placeholder there, right? Usually just null. 
just to keep all the sort of columns lining up right. Okay? So we can omit parameters where defaults exist, but not if subsequent values are required, then we have to put no. Right? So let's see how that would work. If we were going to do the exact same call to our add customer procedure with the same data, but using parameters by position, okay, it could look like this. Execute the stored procedure, and then just the values. Comma separated, listing all the values. Okay, It's just up to us to make sure we're passing them in the right order. Now, fortunately now, okay, which we didn't have a few years ago, is IntelliSense. Right? So when you go execute in this procedure name, it'll start showing you when you start doing this. Every time you hit comma, it'll show you the, the next parameter you're supposed to pass in order. So you're all spoiled rotten, but that's okay. I'm spoiled rotten now too, so it's fair. All right, so what do we see in the middle here? Ah, this null is here because okay, the region is nullable. Okay, it has a default, but if I just left it out of this sequence of values, then it would think that this was supposed to be the region and this was supposed to be the postal code, right? So as a placeholder in this arrangement, I actually have to put the null here. So why don't I have to add the one at the end here for the fax number? Well, that was the fax number. It is the zero three zero. Mm, no, it's the phone no. number. That's the phone number. Is yeah. Nothing after it? That's right. There's nothing more to come after it, so I don't need a placeholder. Right. So if the last three all accept null, when you have nothing for them, you don't have to worry about it. Right. It's only if something has to come in the sequence after the fact. So I know this is basic stuff, but it's important to just make sure we understand it. Okay. Output parameters, on the other hand. Remember, this is kind of an old-fashioned language, right? So this looks a little awkward compared to the more modern ways that we often handle output parameters, but hey, it does work and it gets the job done. We have to use this output keyword, and it has to be both in the create procedure statement, which is not surprising, it makes sense, but we also have to include it when we call it to execute, right? That's what seems a little old-fashioned about it. The calling statement, must contain a variable to receive the return value, and it labels it as an output as well. So consider, I hope you had a nice, good, nutritious lunch, and you're ready to think with advanced mathematical uh, viewpoints on things, right? We have some uh, super sophisticated math we're doing here. All right, we're ready? Okay, create procedure math tutor. I have two parameters. Now these are input parameters. Why do I know they're input? Because they don't say output, okay? So I'm gonna pass in two small integers, M1 and M2, as input parameters. Then I'm defining a return value, in a sense, as an output parameter. Okay, I'm naming it at result, and I have to put the keyword output here as I define the stored procedure, so that it will know to return this as an output parameter. I say as, and then I have my super sophisticated mathematical calculation, right? Pulling in all of your algebra and calculus you learned in school. Okay, the, the result, don't forget the keyword set or select, equals m1 times m2. Woohoo! There we go. And then that's it, we're done. Okay? So that's fine. Let's see how we would call this and how we handle this output parameter. Now think about what's going to happen here. We want to send a value back. How in code do you? catch a value. What am I going to need in order to trap that or get that value that's passed back? What do we use to store any value in code? A variable. A variable. Exactly. Right? Just think of it when you're playing catch with the procedure. It's going to throw a ball back. You have to have a catcher's glove. Well, that catcher's glove in this case will be our variable that we need for our output parameter. So, to call math tutor then, I need to declare a variable. The name of this variable doesn't have to have any correlation to the names of the parameters whatsoever. I could call it whatever I want. Right? It's my variable in my script. Who cares who wrote the procedure and what they called their parameter? So I make a variable. I call my procedure here to execute, math tutor, passing as input parameters a couple of digits. Okay, And then here's where I set up to receive the output. So I have to have a variable, my catcher's glove ready to receive it when it passes it back. But I also have to include that keyword output right here in the execute command, right? And then it will execute it. Oh, God, I forgot that was up here. Okay, I was gonna ask you, what's, what's gonna be the answer? 
Oh, you read it, didn't you? Or did you figure it out on your own? Totally figured it out. All right. All right. Okay, there you go. So that's how an output parameter works, right? Okay, so that's, I know it's basic stuff, but it's important before we go on. So in our scripting practice then, so here's those two that we dealt with yesterday. By the way, I already posted our solutions we did in class. I know we didn't quite get time to finish the second one, but I did with the next section after you, right? So there's the solutions for one and two. So I'd like you to take time, do three and four in class right now, okay? Uh, and uh, get that practice. Or, you know, if you want to, also under assignments, I should stop recording. <laughs>